Yeah, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on from where you join us. And welcome to today's talk by Lars Nieberg, which is part of our live theory lab. And um, this is a lecture series organized by Markus Werkle Bergner, Ulman Lindenberger, and Imke Kruse, and hosted by the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. Um, this lecture series is part of the educational program of the Life Graduate School. And will be about um, the today's talk will be about 45 minutes, and there's time for questions afterwards. As it is a good and old tradition in the Life Graduate School, we will allow fellows to ask the questions first and then open up to the broader audience. If you want to ask a question, please use the little sign with a question mark on your screen and not the hand raised symbol. So this makes things a bit easier for us. So um, my name is Miriam Sander and um, I will be hosting today's sessions together with uh, Nico Schuck, who will be on the back for the question uh, session and um, be available if you experience any problems. Um, and I welcome also Sarah Park, Colin Frank and Alexander Skovron, uh, who are live fellows of our school. And then of course, um, we welcome Lars Nieberg, who will be introduced by Alexander Skovron in a minute. One last housekeeping issue. Um, please remember that this um, session is recorded and will be later on available on YouTube. So if you don't want to appear on the video or if you don't want to have your voice recorded, please don't ask a question. Okay, I think that was it. And then I will hand over to Alexander. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I have the great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Lars Nieberg. Uh, he is Professor for Neuroscience at Umeå University in Sweden. Uh, he is Director of the Umeå Center for Functional Brain Imaging and a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences since 2008. He is a very distinguished scholar in the field of aging cognitive neuroscience. Uh, his work focuses on identifying genetic, brain and lifestyle factors determining heterogeneity in uh, age, aging trajectories. And one of his, his best well known works is probably the Bitula Longitudinal Study, which is a prospective cohort study that started in 1989 and was aimed to track changes in memory functioning across the lifespan and to identify risk factors and preclinical signs of dementia. So, thank you very much for joining us today, Professor Nieberg, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of, of the live series and uh, present some of the work we are doing on uh, brain and cognition and uh, how they are changing across the lifespan. Um, maybe not all of you know where Umeå is located in the world. So I thought I'd start out by um, a little um, cartoon here showing Umeå here far up north. Uh, you have Rome down here, so it's pretty pretty high up, uh, close to the polar circle, uh, which would be about here. See Iceland up here. Uh, we are nicely located by Umeå River and close to the Baltic Sea. Um, Actually, uh, one signature mark of Umeå is, is birch trees. Um, I guess few would have guessed that, but in the old days you had a lo lot of wooden houses and uh, a lot of fires. So these were initially planted to prevent fire uh, from spreading among the houses and they have uh, remained here uh, since then. So someone actually counted them to be 2,300 in downtown Umeå, so uh, quite a lot. Um, another thing we have a lot of up here uh, is the northern lights. Um, hard to see now when we have the midnight sun, but they are here all, all the time, and especially in the fall, uh, quite visible. So this uh, may look quite nice and well, but I also included this, this picture from the waterfront. Uh, you see how it can look, say, in February or March. I actually see my family here out, out by the water here. So we have plenty of time uh, to focus on research during the winter months. And it's my pleasure to talk a bit about it here uh, today. 
So uh, Alexander mentioned the uh, UMIO Center for Functional Brain Imaging, or UFBI in short. Uh, there too we have this uh, birch tree to summarize the different fields of study, uh, the different branches of the lab, if you like. So for example, we have a lot of focus on, on dopamine, dopaminergic neurotransmission in the brain, a uh, big focus on Parkinson's disease and uh, cognitive changes uh, uh, that you see there in addition to the motor symptoms. Um, interventions, uh, it's also a big part of the lab activities. Uh, we have both uh, cognitive uh, forms of training as uh, this example of working memory training and physical interventions. Uh, we do quite a bit of uh, patient studies, clinical fMRI, and uh, the recent project is this one on uh, glioma, where we use imaging in conjunction with patient registers, metabolomics, and neuropsychology. But today, I'll focus on what may be the core of the activities here, uh, projects on aging memory and dementia. So, uh, as many of you know, perhaps all of you know, we have had this fantastic development over the last 150 years, you see here on the x-axis. So you see here how life expectancy has changed from about 1850 to 2000. And you see this for different countries like US, Sweden, Germany, UK, France and Japan. And throughout these countries, we see this dramatic uh, increase in life expectancy. 1850, it was about 45 years, and it has almost doubled in these uh, 150 years. So this is good, and it means that now in these countries, we will have an enlarged segment of uh, people, say 75 and uh, above. Um, and they're really sort of uh, two sides to this. One that's discussed a lot is that we may be facing a situation where we have many elderly sitting at home, alone, uh, perhaps depressed, and as illustrated here by these yellow notes, having to put memory stickers all over the place due to memory problems. Uh, the World Alzheimer's Report have also forecasted that from the about 50 million uh, demented people we have globally today, it will go up to about 75 uh, in only 10 years, and by 2050 exponentially increase to over 130 million. So these are kind of the challenges <clears throat> that come with this uh, increase in life expectancy. But on the other hand, you also have then more and more of these individuals in the population here is Harriet Thompson finishing a race San Diego Marathon, 92 years old. And here's another example, Swedish Dagny Karlsson started a blog when she was 100, was an actor in a movie uh, just a few years ago, and is, is highly active on social media. So this is really what you would like to have, an increased rate of, of these type of uh, individuals uh, in this yellow segment, 75 years and above. And when we ask people in our studies, they don't worry so much that they won't be able to run the marathon, but they do worry about problems with the brain. In particular, they worry that they will lose their memory and not be able to function independently. So, of course, we have many different forms of memory. Here is one uh, well-known taxonomy. And in general, uh, stuff like uh, procedures, knowing how to ride a bike, they are not that uh, affected in aging. And facts, semantic memories, are also quite well preserved. Instead, it tends to be episodic, explicit memory, uh, where you see the biggest age differences uh, in older age. So that's considered the most age-sensitive long-term memory system. And we typically also see uh, quite a lot of decline when we measure uh, working 
memory. So uh, to understand why this happened, uh, the tradition has to look at brain changes associated with episodic memory decline. And you have a lot of studies uh, addressing that question. So for example, uh, the hippocampus region in the medial temporal lobe, that is an, uh, a region where you see a lot of shrinkage, a lot of atrophy, uh, starts to kick in say around 60s and then uh, you see a sharp drop. For the cortices uh, in the medial temporal lobe like the anterior cortex you also tend to see uh, uh, a lot of atrophy perhaps kicking in a bit later and here you see a segment from the frontal lobes pars triangularis where you have cortical thickness on the y-axis and there you even seem to have an indication that you have uh, an aging effect kicking in earlier. So structurally, the brain is changing and that goes with declining episodic memory. Uh, there are also other kinds of age-related changes. So you have accumulation of the disease-related proteins like beta amyloid and also tau. You can measure these in the CSF, in the cerebrospinal fluid, and you can also use imaging techniques like PET, positron emission tomography. So you can see when you start to see deviations for these biomarkers and uh, also then uh, uh, use MRI to measure, for example, hippocampal volume and relate that to cognitive decline. And a final example of an age-sensitive uh, brain change would be the dopaminergic uh, system. Here you see simply three examples of dopamine binding uh, in the stratum, the basal ganglia deep in the brain for a 34-year-old male, a 50-year-old male, and a 73-year-old male. And in general, binding tends to go down, perhaps both as a combination of fewer receptors and less endogenous dopamine being produced. So all that, although that uh, neurotransmitter dopamine is typically associated with motor functions, uh, we have been pursuing the hypothesis for quite some years that it's also a critical one to take into account to understand age-related memory decline. That was all about uh, brain changes that may go with uh, declining episodic memory. But there is also an emerging interest in the other side, preservation of functions. So here you see uh, some examples uh, together with Sara Pudas uh, published this review last year in annual review on successful memory aging. Uh, there was this book, Resilience in Aging, published a few years ago. And in the Lancet Commission's series 2017, there was this paper on dementia prevention, intervention and care. And they concluded, among other things, that we should be really ambitious about prevention. They recommended active treatment of hypertension in middle age and older age to reduce dementia incidence. And also other kinds of uh, interventions more childhood education, exercise, social engagement, reducing smoking, manage hearing loss, depression, as we saw for that older man in the beginning, uh, treatment of diabetes and obesity. All of this may contribute to reduce up to a third of dementia cases. So here the idea is how can we preserve and uh, restore functions I should say that we have a long history here with, with German pioneers. Uh, here's a book published already 30 years ago by Paul and Margaret Boltes uh, um, uh, from the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. So clearly then we seem to have different paths to uh, cognition in older age and in particular to intact cognition. Exactly how this is happening is still debated, but as we'll be discussing today, we for sure have genetic influences and likely also environmental influences. And they uh, influence reserve factors, 
maintenance factors and your ability to compensate. And together, these will then uh, contribute to individual differences in uh, cognitive aging. This is from a consensus paper we published a couple of years ago, an international group. And here is another uh, paper uh, with a bigger focus on dementia, also addressing reserve, uh, both cognitive and brain reserve, along with brain maintenance. So what do these uh, concepts then say about uh, preserved cognition in aging? I think you can see, see them as speaking to tertiary versus primary prevention. Uh, reserve and compensation have actually been uh, around for a very long time and then used to explain a discrepancy between uh, what you could expect to be the magnitude of brain insult as a function of aging, for example, and the ability level of an individual. Already 37, Rothschild uh, spoke about the individual differences in the capacity to compensate, and blessed it all, 68, talked about the reserve capacity of the cerebrum. In, in the context of uh, today's focus, cognitive aging, uh, these terms have been used by many to explain why some people can have preserved cognition or at least very good cognition, despite what's assumed uh, universal brain aging. Uh, people have talked about brain reserve, uh, which essentially means that if you have a larger brain, you can tolerate more change. You start out at a higher level, so it may take longer time before brain shrinkage needs a critical threshold. Cognitive reserve, that is more related to the software, various strategies, uh, techniques that you may pick up uh, in school, in, in job, other types of challenges that also lead to a way of coping. But all of these ideas then, kind of assume that the brain must be changing in a negative direction as we get older. And we have like to uh, add a complementary perspective to this by, by proposing the notion of brain maintenance. And here the core idea is simple. We will have individual differences in the manifestation of age-related brain changes, which allow some to show little or even no cognitive decline in aging. So in contrast to these perspectives that all assume that there must be negative change in aging, brain maintenance is zooming in on the possibility that some older adults may indeed be able to preserve brain structure and function high, high up in aging. So uh, this notion then that we put forward in 2012 is based on three key assumptions. And the first one is that there should be marked individual differences in both cognitive level, how well you do on tests, and also change in aging how rapidly your performance is, is, is uh, going down as you get older. And uh, we have tested this uh, first assumption using data from the project Alexander mentioned uh, at the beginning in his presentation, the Betla project. This is uh, something that's been going on up here in Umeå uh, since the late 80s. And as some of you may know, Betula is Latin for birch tree. So we made the connection there to the city of birch trees. So this project is a prospective study on aging, memory and dementia. Uh, we have many goals, uh, but the main ones are to examine changes in health and cognition across the adult lifespan. So we cover pretty much 25 to 100 years as of now. And also to identify early cognitive and biological predictors of dementia and risk factors for dementia. And so far, more than 600 uh, participants in the study have developed uh, dementia. 
Uh, in total, we have included about four and a half thousand participants. Uh, we uh, randomly pick up names from the population registry. So people cannot sign up to be part of the project, but we, uh, we single out their names, send out letters and hope that they will participate. And this is done to make the sample as representative as, pop as possible for the broader population. And when we compare it with uh, Sweden at large, uh, it seems that it is fairly representative. And these individuals then are tested every five years. So we have longitudinal data within person data spanning over some 25 years. And this table uh, shows the basic design. We started the first wave back in 1988 to 90. So there we included 1,000 participants. We had 135-year-olds, 140-year-olds, and so on, up to 180-year-olds. So 10, 10 age groups with 100 individuals in each age group. So there we could only do cross-sectional comparisons. If we wanted to say something about aging, we could guess about that by comparing younger with older. But then the longitudinal component of the study started. So five years later, we reinvited these thousand individuals, and actually over 85% agreed to participate again. Main reason for not returning is death and. Uh, uh, later on in the project uh, uh, due to developing diseases, mainly dementia. At this point in time, we also included two new samples that were either matched with the first sample with regard to their age distribution at their first time of testing, or this sample where the age distribution was matched with the core sample one at their second wave of testing. So this is... Uh, a design that's modeled by uh, one proposed by Cheyenne colleagues, where you try to tease apart age uh, from cohort. It's also very important to stress that by including new individuals who are doing the testing for the first time around and compare it with people who do it the second time around, even though five years ago uh, have passed in the, since the last time, we find that we have a practice effect. You do a little bit better uh, when you did the test five years before than you do it for the first time. Then these practice effects tend to vanish as, as we continue. And then we have continued like this, adding new samples as we go along. Uh, so in total, Four and a half thousand unique participants, uh, almost ten and a half thousand test sessions with more than six thousand longitudinal observations. We measure them on a lot of variables. We have measures of current and past health, uh, dementia, as I mentioned, uh, psychological measures of stress, also measures of cortisol, stress hormones from blood and saliva, inventories of depression, personality, lifestyle, and critical life events. <clears throat> we also have a, an extensive cognitive testing battery that they do on a separate occasion. We have a big focus on episodic memory, as I mentioned, the most age-sensitive long-term memory system, but we also measure prospective memory, implicit memory, word fluency, visospatial ability, and many other functions. Uh, we have a fairly extensive biobank with blood, saliva, DNA, and pretty much uh, everyone went through uh, GWAS, so we have extensive genetic information. And over the years, <clears throat> finally, we have added various forms of imaging sessions to the project. When we started in 88, uh, functional MRI was actually not even invented. But uh, as, as it got more and more popular, 
We have introduced that and now done some thousand uh, imaging sessions in the project. So we like to put these pieces together and understand uh, how brain and cognition and various other factors change together as we get older. So using this data then, we can ask, when does episodic memory begin to decline? And if you only look at the <clears throat> cross-sectional data, the answer is that we see decline for episodic memory, the red circles kicking in very early, say from age 40, 45. It's a little bit better for semantic memory, memory for facts. <clears throat> what about the longitudinal data? Well, here you see it adjusted for practice effects, as I mentioned. And now we have stability in episodic memory up until around age 60. And then do we start to see a decline? And we actually also see for semantic memory that it tends to get a bit better as you get older. And then we only see slight age changes for that for the oldest groups. So this notion that episodic memory kicks in, uh, uh, starts to decline very early, that's primarily based on cross-sectional data. But when you follow people over time, you tend to see that it, it's rather around age 60 that we on average see decline. But average patterns is one thing. So what we are focusing a lot on is heterogeneity or individual differences. And here you see uh, age group on the y-axis and cognition on the x-axis, ranging from high to low cognition. Here cognition is reflecting performance on all cognitive tests, but they are dominated still by measures of episodic memory. <clears throat> we have this skewed distribution so most of the individuals here at the high end of the distribution, they are from the younger age groups and vice versa. Most in the lower end are from the older age groups. But we also have these individuals. People are 70, 75, 80 and perform uh, at or above the mean of 35 to 65 year olds. So clearly there are older individuals will have very high performance. Uh, uh, and that we wanted to look at also in terms of longitudinal data. So Maria Josefsson, she analyzed our longitudinal data. It can look like this. It can go up, it can go down. You may see the general trend towards uh, a downwards going pattern, but lots of individual differences. So Maria, used the random effect pattern mixture model. She differentiated the different age groups. Here is an example for 35 and 65 year olds. And then she considered initial test score, how well you did on a composite measure of episodic memory and slope rate of change over these repeated assessments. And by also considering attrition, which is not random, but the people who do worse tend to drop out from the study, she could classify individuals into three groups, maintainers in green, average in black, and decliners in red. And here you see the overall pattern uh, summarized across all the age groups. So about two thirds of the sample, they meet this average trend. You have stability in episodic memory and you start to see decline at around age 60. You have these individuals who start out at the lower level initially, they have a lower intercept and then they decline at the faster rate. And finally, we have this group, the maintainers, they have a good episodic memory when they start the project and 20 years later, they are still at this uh, very good level. So clearly, I, aging does not uh, equal uh, poor memory. Some maintain cognition well into older ages. 
And other uh, um, studies observed similar patterns. Here is one example uh, from the ABC group, again, separating maintainers from average and major decliners. And here is also a similar pattern for both episodic memory and executive function by Linetol from the ADNI cohort. So all in all, this pattern of heterogeneity also for longitudinal change is replicated in other independent studies. And this type of heterogeneity is also apparent for other forms of cognition than episodic memory. Here is processing speed, for example, letter digit symbol substitution. We see here an earlier onset of average change, but again with massive heterogeneity. And here you see the WISE block design test, also marked age-related effects, but massive heterogeneity. So the Betla patterns support this first key assumption that we have marked individual differences in both cognitive level, how well you do at onset, and how rapidly you change. The second key assumption is that aging individuals differ widely in the amount of brain changes they display. So not all may show marked atrophy or lots of dopamine change. Here you see a hippocampus volume on the y-axis plotted as a function of age, and we have four or five year longitudinal data. So we see stability, start to see a decline around age 55, but again, massive uh, individual differences. So if you can see these yellow individuals, here is one with a very big hippocampus, still big five years later, one with a smaller than average hippocampus showing a lot of atrophy. And here you see these actual cases. This is the individual up here with the big hippocampus. Here is the individual down here with <clears throat> much atrophy. And this individual actually, after this measurement point, dropped out from further study. Uh, this is a, a, a figure from a study by Naftali Ras, Ulman Lindeberger and others. It also shows that we have a general trend towards decline for hippocampus volume, again, with big individual differences. And they found that the ones who had accelerated shrinkage, they had also hypertension, coming back to these lifestyle variables. <clears throat> and a fairly recent paper from the Seattle Longitudinal Study <coughs> looked at cortical thinning and found that hypertension in combination with APOE gene meant that you had the fastest rate of change uh, for that segment. So lots of individual differences and some factors that may moderate uh, these differences. The third main um, assumption then is that change in cognition and change in brain should go together. And this is a tricky thing to show. It's very hard in general to find robust brain cognition associations, but we have tested it using data both from Betula and also from another longitudinal project called COBRA. So I'll give you a few brief examples. Here is an outline of the COBRA study <coughs> done together with colleagues here in Umeå, Lars Beckman and Martin Lövdien at the Karolinska Institute, and Ulman Lindenberger in Berlin. <clears throat> so here we studied 180 individuals at baseline, similar uh, imaging battery as in Betula, also extensive cognitive testing. What's new here is that we use PET, positron emission tomography, to measure dopamine integrity in, in the brain, in this case, dopamine D2 binding using Raclopride. We have done a second follow-up 
and plan to do the third one later on. So this is probably the world's biggest dopamine PET study. And we are now working on the longitudinal uh, data, but we have some cross-sectional data that has been published. And here we see that we have associations between individual differences in binding potential in the core date and how well you do an episodic memory. And also dopamine binding in the hippocampus relates to episodic memory. This is a region in the brain where it's hard to measure dopamine D2 since you have much less receptors here than in the basal ganglia, but in part because we have such a large pat, uh, sub, uh, uh, sample, we have been able to find robust associations. So both individual differences in chordate and hippocampal binding potential explain variation in episodic memory. Uh, here's another example from Betula where we used fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, so you can give a task to the individuals while they lie in the MRI scanner. We used a face name encoding task. So you see a face, unfamiliar face, and you pair it with a name. And that's uh, supposed to tax the hippocampus. And we wanted to co compare then, are there differences between the green and black individuals in terms of how they recruit their hippocampus when they are given this type of task. And we did indeed find that the maintainers, they activated the anterior hippocampus significantly stronger than the average group. Although the average group also performed the task really well. And we compared this with young, who were about half uh, the age of these maintainers, we could see that they tended to have um, a youth-like activation pattern in the hippocampus suggesting preserved MTL functioning. We have been able also to link uh, the volume of the hippocampus, the shrinkage pattern uh, I showed you earlier to change in episodic memory. So here you see in this graph uh, change in episodic memory over 15 years. The slope related to four-year hippocampal atrophy, and we found in this case a significant change-change association. Other studies have looked at other dimensions of brain integrity in aging and showed with PET that individuals who have little uh, tau buildup in the brain they tend to have a more well-preserved uh, episodic memory in aging. And there are some studies suggesting a relation also for beta amyloid, also measured with PET, although the link between beta amyloid and cognition is often weaker than was the case for tau. So these examples then <clears throat> provide support for this third assumption that changes in brain and cognition should, uh, to some degree, uh, go hand in hand. So after establishing uh, support for this key assumption, the next thing we turned to was what predicts one's pattern of memory change in aging, who are the maintainers, essentially. And when we compare maintainers with the average group, we find that people with this maintained pattern of memory, they have higher education, they are more physically active, they have a positive family situation, they are not alone, they have the good variant of the COMP gene that regulates the amount of dopamine uh, in frontal cortex, and we had a higher uh, um, proportion of females than males in this high-performing group. Uh, Sophie Degerman has also looked at epigenetic age and found that these maintainers have younger epigenetic age compared to uh, average and decliners and also compared to uh, normative data. 
For the decliners, we found that there we have a higher percentage of APOE4 carriers. And as you may know, that's the main genetic risk factor. Uh, for Alzheimer's dementia, we had an overrepresentation of males. And here, in the ages where people could be working, we had a higher rate of people who were not working, suggesting some sort of disabilities or, or negative stimulation. So this can then be related back to this quote from the Lancet Commission paper I showed you in the beginning, that uh, one could try to, to influence uh, multiple risk factors, education, exercise, social engagement and smoking which we didn't find support for in this particular study but we didn't examine it so but i don't know that uh, good convergence between our study and this suggestion in the lancet paper so this is uh, a cartoon summing up uh, the different trajectories that you may have to pathological memory decline usual average memory decline or these well-preserved memory functions in aging. So our idea is that genetic and epigenetic mechanisms are important. They interact with lifestyle influences. And in, in the best case, they promote brain maintenance. But if you do have age-related brain changes, you could still reach fairly good levels of memory performance by applying this uh, compensatory uh, processes to some degree. So another prediction that this makes is that fewer people in the uh, memory maintenance group should develop dementia, whereas a higher percentage of the decliners should develop dementia. And we have looked at more than a thousand adults in the project who were followed up to 28 years. And here you see the main results. You see data for decliners, average, and maintainers. And here you see Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and non-demented. And almost 93% remained non-demented for the maintainers, whereas almost half developed dementia in the declining group. So this decline in episodic memory is a strong predictor of dementia development. And episodic memory, but not the much used minimental state examination test, could predict uh, uh, the, that you were on the track to develop dementia up to 10 years uh, prior to actual diagnosis. This was true for both uh, Alzheimer's dementia and vascular dementia, but as you can see, no predictive value of minimental SC. So, brain maintenance, a very positive prospect that seems to allow some people to maintain good memory in aging, but what is it that is maintained in the brain and perhaps in the hippocampus in the case of episodic memory in particular? Ulma Lindenberger and I wrote a book chapter in the latest edition of the Cognitive Neurosciences. Uh, we proposed uh, a set of factors uh, here that may explain it. One set of factors uh, concern maintaining neurons, so avoiding cell death and promoting neurogenesis, the formation of new neurons in the brain. Uh, maintain the intactness of the neurons for dendrites, for axons, and synaptic integrity. And thirdly, maintain non-neural factors like glia cells and vascular health. And I will just give you some uh, snapshots uh, of uh, these factors. And if you're interested, uh, this book is out now, so you can read uh, a bit more in that one. If we start with maintaining neurons, well, it's generally uh, considered that we have relatively little cell death in normal aging, but what is debated is whether we have neurogenesis. Uh, this paper from a 
Karolinska Institute in Sweden suggested that each day you add 700 new neurons to each hippocampus. So an annual turnover of 1.75% uh, in this case. And they suggested this only modestly decline during aging. Then another paper published in Nature suggested that neurogenesis is extremely rare after, say, 20 years of age. And a third paper suggested that ongoing hippocampal neurogenesis sustains human specific cognitive function throughout life. So, as you can see, this is still a, a debated topic, but it, it may suggest that neurogenesis could be one factor underlying brain maintenance. For neuronal morphology, uh, I have an example here about dendrites. Uh, the arborization, if you like, the richness of the dendritic trees, that doesn't differ much between young and old. But the number of spines that you have um, uh, on these neuro uh, dendritic trees, that, that goes down with aging and seems to map to cognition. So that may uh, sort of influence how easy it is to form new synapses as you get older. And the perhaps least research factor uh, is these non-neural factors. But uh, a paper from ADNI published in Nature Communication looked at uh, beta amyloid, uh, functional data, volumetrics, uh, tau, um, A beta, and actually showed that vascular factors may be the ones that earliest predict whether you will turn to early mild cognitive impairment, late mild cognitive impairment, or eventually Alzheimer's disease. And this is also something we have published on ourselves in a paper in TICS a couple of years ago. We, we presented this cartoon model, how stiffening of the aorta may uh, cause excessive pulsatility in the brain that could lead to damage to the parasites that form the blood-brain barrier and that in turn could impair neurovascular uh, coupling so the brain is not able to regulate blood flow uh, in relation to neuronal demands which leads to a failure to sustain neural activity and eventually to cognitive impairment. So this is probably a very neglected factor, this one about vascular factors, but very important. And I think it's coming a lot of papers nowadays that uh, support uh, that view. So it's time to wrap up. Um, I've suggested that brain maintenance is a neglected, but not so rare reality. In our data, almost one out of five showed signs of brain maintenance. And with this growing older population that I started out the presentation by discussing, that will likely continue in the future. It will be very crucial for societies to avoid decline and promote maintenance. At the individual level, what can be done? Well, Mia Kivipelt and others have done this Finnish geriatric study showing that if you train people over one, two years, you have a possibility to impact these factors positively. Uh, at the societal level, we know that there have been these positive cohort differences as captured by the Flynn effect, also uh, perhaps for rate of change. And there is quite some evidence now for a decline in dementia incidence over uh, successive cohorts. That's been seen in Sweden and it's been seen in US. And this together may reflect core changes in education and vascular factors. That is modifiable factors that we can do something about. So if we continue to work on these, we may 
have a higher rate of brain maintenance in the population in the future, which will benefit individuals as well as societies. So there, I think my time is up. Uh, thank you for the attention. I think we have some time for questions. Great, thank you, Lars. So we will all come back and join you now. I <clears throat> hope it was okay to give a talk without without an audience, but but there was an audience, so uh, don't worry. Okay, we are about 100 people, so um, you were not alone. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So we have um, sufficient time for questions, and I would like to ask uh, the fellows if they have questions to start now. Sarah. Yeah, thanks so much. This is super interesting. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to ask um, kind of, is there a comparison between interventions kind of later in life? I mean, you mentioned this, this Finnish study. Um, I'm assuming they were looking at older adults there. Um, but it seems to me also that a lot of the stuff you talked about, like education and also these cohort effects, these would be something that would come into play earlier in life. Is there kind of any direct comparison between interventions earlier in life versus later in life? Well, in this Lancet Commission paper, they actually have this life course model that uh, it might be important to influence different uh, factors at different stages in life. So hypertension would be perhaps, say, in the 40s, 50s, education earlier, uh, hearing loss would kick in later on, diabetes, it may vary, obesity, it may vary. But uh, I think in general, um, uh, the, the problems may be tied to particular ages, and that's when you're, uh, I guess, uh, most likely to be successful if you intervene. Yeah, Sarah, this answer. I, I, my audio cut out for a second. I missed the last half of the answer. <laughs> All right, uh, well, in brief, I mean, uh, in this model, uh, in the Lancet paper, the interventions are sort of um, bound to be most effective if they are introduced at certain ages. So mm -hmm. if hearing loss becomes more uh, prevalent uh, at certain ages, that's when you're supposed to do that. If uh, hypertension is, is, is magnified at certain ages, that's when you should start treating it. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, Prevention uh, is about uh, preventing the disease, but one shouldn't sort of give hypertension medicine uh, from age 10. Yeah. But there is a time window when you should introduce it uh, and, and when it's supposed to be effective. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, Alexander Skovron has a question too. You have to uh, wait and try to unmute you. Now you now it should work. All right, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, I was thinking uh, a bit about the implications um, because you made this differentiation bas basically between uh, vascular maintenance and basically neural cell maintenance and. I was wondering what the implications or how you're thinking about the implications for fMRI studies. So if we see, for example, an fMRI studies differentiation uh, in, uh, in task performance between age groups and different uh, activation, different areas, we can't really know whether this is because this person um, basically first uh, had deterioration in the vascular system and that led maybe then to uh, decline in the underlying structure whether the vascular system is intact um, but the neural system has declined. So do you think it would be important for such studies um, to take more closely into account uh, vascular, the vascular integrity of the system as well and if so what kind of measures would you think are best to look at and more easily accessible in an aging uh, fMRI study? Oh, definitely, that's a very good question. And <clears throat> the short answer is yes. I think um, 
that vascular factors can actually influence uh, the pattern you see in age comparative studies. Um, I'm not sure uh, I would say that we differentiate between neuronal and vascular maintenance. I think we see these as contributing factors that may promote, say, hippocampal maintenance. Um, so you need to preserve the neurons, but you also need to preserve the the uh, vascular supply to these neurons. And if this uh, works in tandem, you have the be best chances of, of, of achieving uh, uh, hippocampal uh, brain maintenance and then uh, hopefully also preserved episodic memory. Uh, in terms of what measures to use, well, as you know, the MRI allows you to measure perfusion. That could be one way uh, to some people have tried combined ASL fMRI studies with different rates of success. It's quite a difficult technique. It, you, starting to appear also studies now when you use MRI to try to, to measure the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. And, and I think that could be a very interesting avenue for, for future studies. Aside from these extra MRI measures, I think one sort of suggestion has been that you could try to set up uh, interaction designs when you do your uh, experiments. So is it so that you see always a main effect of aging, so you have a reduced ball signal in general, or is it specific to a certain condition? I guess that could be indicative of more of a neuronal effect than a vascular effect. But then again, as we know that with the neurovascular coupling, these effects are so intimately linked. So it could still be if you have problems to, to regulate this neurovascular coupling, it may uh, be reflected as differences in the bold signal um, uh, in the end and, and impaired performance. So I think it is. Uh, it is uh, really an emergent uh, area. I mean, it's been recognized, but we are getting more and more tools and more and more data to suggest that this is uh, a very important factor, perhaps in particular for normal aging, where we don't seem to have that massive cell death as in, say, dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases. So, um, I guess at best we should be aware that if you see differences in a blood flow based technique like bold imaging, it is not a given that it reflects neuronal uh, changes per se. Thank you. Colin Frank has another question. Thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so when you were talking about the maintainers, um, have you or anyone looked at the relative contributions of each? Is there one that contributes the most to the variability um, in the maintenance, or are they all relatively small and they all contribute um, relatively? Um, well, we presented in the paper a regression model. So to the degree you believe that, you could rank order them in terms of, say, weights uh, in that model. Um, um, I think it's important to look at many data sets if you want to do that. Um, for example, um, the gender differences we have seen repeatedly also in other contexts. So that, that seems to be there. Um, the, the presence of APOE4 in conjunction with poor cognitive development, I think that is also one that has a big influence. Um, we looked at other factors that uh, could have played a role like BDNF and Kibra and didn't see it. So, I mean, even if you have a fairly big sample, uh, you may need a greater power to really ask what you're asking. Um, I should also mention that we were pretty conservative in selecting these variables. We have many more in Betula that you could potentially look at. and. Uh, um, they might be just as important. So I think uh, this is an example that genetic and lifestyle factors do map on to this distinction between maintenance and decline, but I don't think it is uh, at all an exhaustive list. Uh, it's probably just snapshots. So 
we don't know, but I would be curious uh, to find out if we can say which is the key one. Uh, I'm afraid that the genetic factors would be high up on the list, but uh, as uh, Livingstone et al. concluded in their uh, commission report, uh, if it can still influence up to a third of the variance, that, that's quite, uh, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think there's another question by Sarah Pock, and after that I would also invite the rest of the audience to ask their questions by using this little question mark sign. Okay, Sarah. Yeah, I have another question um, also regarding the maintainers versus um, decliners. I'm wondering if you've looked at, um, I guess in intervention studies generally the idea is to get pretty a pretty homogenous sample, um, but is there any comparison of how effective a specific intervention, be it, I don't know, social uh, exercise, et cetera, um, how this would affect these different groups of people? Um, I think my, my reading of the literature is that people, for example, who have looked at the benefit of physical exercise, they may screen for individuals who aren't super uh, physically active to begin with, uh, and the same with other factors. So to some degree, you may, in that sense, bias your, your findings. We, 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 we seek to have a representative sample and then look at heterogeneity within that. But uh, in the spirit of personalized medicine and, and sort of a more uh, individual-centered approach, I guess what we have been thinking about is that based on these findings, one wouldn't necessarily say that everyone need a more social stimulation or uh, physical activity, but it would be pretty much specific to each and every individual, what would be the, the recipe. So I think uh, hopefully we'll see more of that, that uh, we have some sort of screens, uh, maybe uh, initially, and uh, then we select the intervention based on that, and uh, hopefully we can get stronger effects that way. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So I, I think I will just uh, jump a bit on that question. So I liked very much the, da the recent data that you showed on uh, the memory profiles that predict the um, predict dementia later on and that you that you can show that the MMSE which we all use in all our studies is not predictive so yeah. um, and I mean you, you only mentioned that shortly so and you, I mean you mentioned episodic memory so the question is what kind of task actually would be the one that we should use if we um, if we want to do that and if the hippocampus is key in this um, maintenance question probably should should it be something associative or spatial navigation or what would be your suggestion for us? Well, I think all the ones you mentioned would be good candidates. Um, perhaps delayed recall uh, could be a good candidate too. Um, we used the face name to promote binding, um, something uh, taxing novelty or spatial processes. Anything that could give you a hint of, of uh, impaired or intact hippocampal functioning. Um, and I guess uh, I don't want to sort of shoot down MMSC. It can serve its purpose, but it wasn't designed to be a predictive instrument, but rather a bedside instrument for cognitive screening. So I think it's not, uh, not at all surprising that we cannot use that as a predictive tool 10 years prior to a diagnosis. So, uh, but I still think it's important to 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 have that information uh, out there, since many, since it's such an easy to administer task, tend to use it also with uh, non-deceased groups. And mm -hmm. then I think you will account for little variance and would rather use tasks, as you suggested, that could have have an hippocampal taxing component to them. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps, I mean, if you were to look for um, other um, aspects of brain and cognitive integrity, um, executive measures could also be, be of interest. And we saw in the ADNI paper that they tended to go hand in hand there, the episodic and executive. And this is something we have 
we wrote about in this chapter, me and Ullman, is maintenance general or specific. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have well-preserved uh, hippocampal system, does that mean that your cortex, uh, your dopamine system, uh, your connectivity pattern, uh, that they are also well-preserved? And I don't know, we don't know the answer, uh, but uh, we are looking at it. And uh, we see some signs of specificity, at least in the preliminary data. Yeah, thank you. Um, Markus. Wackelbeckner has another question for you. Hi Lars, uh, thank you very much for this uh, inspiring talk. Uh, it's a great uh, overview of, of all this uh, tremendous work you did over the past years. Um, I have more a uh, uh, general uh, question. Um, if, if I think about uh, some literature uh, in, in the past 20 years, uh, in the field of cognitive aging, uh, there was a there was an urge to find a limited set of factors that might provide a mechanistic view of what cognitive aging might be. Let's say the processing speed hypothesis, uh, inhibition theory, uh, dopamine hypothesis, uh, you name it. Uh, there were several views where, like in the in the candidate gene approach, where it says one single factor that drives the whole system. Uh, your talk in the in the data you showed. Uh, rather suggests that we might uh, currently uh, be in a situation uh, like the, 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 the candidate gene uh, approach, that it's rather a, a broad array of minor effects from a, a lot of genes, minor effects from a lot of uh, factors that contribute to successful cognitive aging. Uh, so if I, if I now uh, consider the Betula study, which is a huge uh, study in terms of time and money and uh, participants hours spent on, um, uh, what do you think, where, uh, where might the field head to? Um, do we have a chance to find uh, a mechanistic understanding of cognitive aging in the near future? Or are we just at the beginning where we need to roll out even larger studies than Betula over an even longer time frame to, to have the chance to understand the mechanistic uh, frames for cognitive aging? Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. I think um, in the spirit of, of today's presentation, I think uh, what's emerging uh, is the perspective that you can have well-preserved uh, uh, functions uh, into high age. But in past research, uh, a lot of focus has been recruitment, say, from memory clinics or from hospitals, etc. And then I think, as you described, a lot of the, the field focused on, on trying to find uh, often single factors accounting for that uh, impairment. But perhaps if you also consider uh, what are the players for preserved functioning? It's not necessarily the flip side of those who go with uh, impairment. Um, so then I think your GWAS metaphor is, is, is pretty good. Although I still also think that uh, it will be uh, a bit person-centered. And I guess um, it resonates well with the MPI in Berlin to talk about this sort of not uh, uh, universal uh, frameworks, but uh, that um, with one size uh, fit all. So um, to that, that I, I, I think we in Betula have done our share. Uh, the sample is very old. Uh, the majority has actually passed away. But I think it would make sense to start new ones and also with the new technologies that are coming. And I've been thinking also uh, with our findings, with the cohort effects, uh, to some degree, some of the knowledge we have generated will be sort of in there for the long term, but other may be sort of context and time specific. So it may not generally apply. So I think we should look at many societies. We need sort of new data. Um, uh, for us up here, I mean, people studied for five, six years. Uh, uh, for those who are 90 or 100 today, it's totally different situation today. So that will probably also influence our understanding of which are the key factors. So 
Yes, I would say, unfortunately, although it is costly and takes a long time, I think uh, it's necessary to, to repeat some of this work. And I guess SHARE, the European project, is a good example where you try to continue uh, adding uh, data. And uh, perhaps it can also be boosted in terms of cognition. But with the new techniques, with metabolomics, proteomics, um, blood-brain barrier imaging, uh, uh, one wish one could go back to PhD school. So <laughs> lots of opportunities. Thank yeah. you, Lars. Okay, we have uh, two more last questions. One is uh, by Ulman Lindenberger. Hi, Lars. Can you hear me? Hi, Ulman. I can very well. Yeah, wonderful to to see you. And it's it's at least a little bit of a substitute for having some of the regular meetings that we used to have in in, in pre-corona times. So it's it's a it's a pleasure to to listen to your voice and see all the wonderful data. Well, I, I have a question. I have a question regarding our uh, good old friend uh, education. Um, I mean, it, it's clear that there is a relationship between having more education and being less likely to be diagnosed with, with dementia. And, and the question that is a little bit up in the air these days is whether this means that education itself is a, is a maintenance factor, that it makes the, the, the brain age less, or whether it gives you a boost in early adulthood so that it simply takes you a longer uh, uh, it takes you. Uh, it takes more time to reach uh, the threshold uh, uh, where people start getting a dementia diagnosis. And then, strictly speaking, it would not be a, a maintenance factor, I would argue, but it would simply be something that keeps you further away from from the threshold without actually affecting uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, uh, so you could have equal rates of maintenance or equal likelihood of maintenance in, in low and high education people. Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious what, what, what your current take is uh, on, on, on that issue, whether there's also a maintenance contribution, if you wish, to uh, uh, the positive effects uh, of education. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Ulma. Very interesting question. And um, I wish I could say I believe that education relates to maintenance or say slope. But I don't. I think uh, from bit my work by Martin Levdeen uh, has shown that yes, it, it it relates to intercept, but not to slope. And I think some other work that uh, you have been involved with and some meta analysis would rather support these Bitla findings that uh, rate of change is not strongly related to level of education in childhood. So by these views, um, I would think as of now that the education may to some degree relate to Katzmann's old notion of brain reserve. Mm -hmm. Perhaps at critical ages you can contribute to synaptic density, other things like that, and mm -hmm. that will prevent you from reaching that critical threshold uh, sooner uh, <clears throat> rather than later, uh, many years later. But whether uh, it will help to prevent you from rate of change, um, I don't think uh, that will turn out to be the history. Um, so I think uh, in my understanding, the link from, uh, of education is shifting from the traditional view of seeing it linked to cognitive reserve, but rather being linked to something more static like uh, initial brain reserve, but not mm -hmm. how then the brain is changing. I don't know what your take is, Oman. Yeah, very similar. So I, I I was just curious to have your current views on it, and I I would I would agree with that. I mean, um, which still is a very very important factor, of course. So it's that that such a such a offset effect may produce uh, uh, maybe very beneficial uh, over the lifetime, of course. Yeah, and I think we need more studies, perhaps also in relation to dementia. I mean, as you said, there are more convincing cases there that uh, the nun story, etc. But still, not so much um, data. So it will be interesting to follow up using studies like uh, Betula and Bayes and other ones. 
Thank you. Okay, so last question, uh, Nico Schuck. Um, yes, hi Lars. Thanks for a really fascinating talk. It's really interesting data. Um, I was particularly struck by the fact that maintainers and decliners and the average people differentiate so early. And I was wondering whether you had looked at whether the factors that are beneficial for these groups might be different. So whether interventions that would help people who are from the start on the more decliner trajectory are different from those factors that could help people who have a relatively high level of functioning, help them not to decline at later age. We haven't done it uh, in a systematic way, but uh, I should say that although it comes out this way, uh, on average, when you put together the data, that it seems as a maintainer must necessarily start out with a high intercept. It is not a given from the statistical model. And you do have people who perhaps begin within the range of average people but while the average people will start to drop, the sort of average starting maintainer will remain at that level. So it was really a feature of this model to try to decompose uh, uh, starting value and rate of change. Now, I think we cannot do it perfectly. They are related. Um, but to some degree, then, I guess your question relates to this uh, uh, issue that uh, I discussed with Sarah earlier, that if you already have a very high physical activity, um, and we know that that promotes maintenance, maybe this is not for you. Uh, um, this is not what you would sort of invest your extra time in. If you have a sort of highly challenging job, maybe this uh, idea of a uh, sort of cognitive boost will not <laughs> be that helpful. So that was <clears throat> in the spirit of my notion of, of having an initial screen <clears throat> to identify and differentiate where you would uh, sort of zoom in and, and uh, hopefully then get more of an effect size eventually. Uh, whether initial uh, level um, influences rate of change, I think, is also still largely unresolved. Um, Sonia Lupien has shown that we have just as much heterogeneity in young ages when it comes to hippocampal volume, for example. It's not necessarily a given that one with a big hippocampus in younger age will have less or a slower rate of change than one with a smaller. And I guess it goes also for other variables. So um, we have struggled with it. And uh, I think there are also measurement properties. Can you decline as much if, if you start out as a low level as someone starting out as a high? Um, so tricky to study, but my, my, my best answer is try to tailor made based on, on, on the signature of your individuals. And, and that's maybe how you can get at the bigger effect sizes of your interventions. Okay, so we plan to close here, but there's still more and more questions coming. So I, I would like to give Naftali Rath the last chance to comment on your talk. I think time is up actually. <laughs> Naftali, it's your turn. And uh, uh, good to hear your excellent talk as usual. Uh, one question is on the maintainers, and uh, we've been struggling with this question, of course, like everybody else. Thing is that, at least in the U.S., uh, education, socioeconomic class, all those variables—they're all rolled in together, they're all baked in together with the health. I mean, the, the way the American system is structured is that there's a very strong relationship between education and health. And so it's very hard to disentangle when we say that education is a sign of some reserve. Uh, 
my reading of the literature is that education is a sign of health maintenance. So uh, less educated people are more likely to be obese, have diabetes, have high blood pressure, etc., etc. Et so uh, we we do find that uh, at least in in our sample, we find that metabolic health or metabolic risk factors are actually uh, much better predictors of uh, uh, brain maintenance. If you will. So uh, it's they seem, and we also have evidence from base study that metabolic indicators seem to far less better in a coherent factor. So I think that would be a good place to look, and you see some occasional uh, indicator level studies when people say obesity predict this and this, diabetes predict this and that, uh, Alzheimer is a type three diabetes, all these theories, but it's all uh, I think uh, presenting much broader factors. Yeah, I think the vascular take as, as I, I mentioned at the end is super important and also I think you underscore what I mentioned uh, in response to Marcus's question there about do we need to do more studies I mean I don't think that uh, education uh, is as strongly tied to economy in Sweden or perhaps in Europe as it in, is in US so so I think you we may partly get different answers depending on the socioeconomic context of the studies. And uh, we, 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 we try to have a representative sample, but I think a lot is based on convenience samples and that will also influence the findings. So, uh, but uh, we have done some comparative work together with colleagues in Oslo, Christine Wallhoved and Anders Fjell, and there we don't see that the, the uh, sort of income variable is playing as much of a role in Europe as it does in US. Um, so we can we can probably sort of generalize some, but not all the findings. Uh, but the metabolic factors, I think, they are uh, super interesting, and and we have uh, we have seen that they predict dementia at least. Uh, five years prior to diagnosis, so why not the cognitive slopes? Um. Okay, so yeah, did, did you want to add something, Les? No. no. Sorry. No, well, thanks, Lars. Thank you, Natalie. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think we are really uh coming to, we should really be coming to an end now and uh, uh i would like to thank again lars nieberg for joining us for this lecture series today and uh, for such a great and inspiring talk and all the live fellows for for doing this with us and um i wish you all a good day see you next week bye bye